Adaptations of two pathogens that facilitate entry and transmission between hosts. Easy, we can do this one. See that you know this or you don't know this. You can't really make too much up. So, come on, what are your two examples? Let me ask Serene, give me one example. Pick a pathogen and tell me one adaptation it has for entry or transmission. Uh, for virus, they right. contain the... Virus, can, yes? Yeah. What do they have? They, can, they contain a capsid protein to yeah. protect, protect them from being destroyed by... Protects against... I'd say it protects the genetic material. Okay, protects the genetic material of the virus. Okay, protects genetic material from host immune system. Facilitating transmission. Facilitating transmission. Now, what I would say here, everyone, is this is okay, but it's very weak. Do you know why this is a weak adaptation? It's because all viruses have this. So yeah, you could talk about this. You could, but it's just very vague. You want to be specific. What are some specific adaptations bugs have? Vectors. Pardon? Right in a bit louder. Oh, I said vectors like mosquitoes can bypass the skin barrier by um, using pathogen to inject into the blood directly. Do mosquitoes need to use pathogens or do pathogens need to use mosquitoes? Mos mosquitoes inject a pathogen into the blood. Yeah. So whose adaptation is that? Is it the mosquitoes adaptation? Oh, mosquitoes. Yeah. Mosquitoes adaptation. Well, we're talking about pathogens here, so not vectors. Could we talk so about could, yeah? um, like enveloped viruses and non-enveloped? Very good. Any idea how? I'll give you a little hint, right? HEP A and B are enveloped viruses, which means they have a phospholipid bilayer, which means they're posh, comfy, and sensitive viruses, right? They can't travel through the digestive system. If they do travel to the, through the digestive system, the phospholipid bilayer gets destroyed, the virus gets destroyed. And so those viruses can only be transmitted sexually or through blood. But HEP A and HEP E... They are non-enveloped, everyone. They don't have that posh, soft, glycolipid, phospholipid bilayer, right? They, since all they have is a protein capsid, they have no envelope or outside of that. Those viruses can pass through the harsh pH of the gastric acid, the alkaline conditions of the small intestines, and they tend to cause diarrhea, vomiting, and a gastroenteritis kind of illness. Do you all see how that's an adaptation? So not having an envelope is an adaptation. Did you all understand that? When you don't have an envelope, right, you don't need to protect or save that envelope. And as a result, you can pass through more harsher conditions. And do you see how this is very specific to transmission? This one here is just saying, oh, it's, it's got this capsid, which enables it to transmit. But what we're saying specifically here, it's still about the, the capsid, but we're mentioning specific diseases too. So Hep A, for example, e.g., is a non-enveloped virus. So this is the same. I'm just improving this one here, right? It's a non-enveloped virus, which enables it it to protect viral DNA against gastric acid, alkaline intestinal secretions, and it can cause, therefore, fecal-oral transmission. Fecal-oral transmission. Do you see how now we're specifically linking it to transmission? So I'd say this is a better answer. Do you all see how it's... It's just an improved version of what we said above. So I'm going to rub out this section here. Make sense to everyone? Good. So capsid, tough, 
protein capsid protects the DNA. Tough protein capsid. Very good. What else do we have? Um, plasmodium yeah. falci parum. Yeah, so what about a, plasmodium? So it's a um, it's a plasmodium, and basically it's got um, an e extreme or like a very difficult life cycle, which allows it to get past like most of the um, immune res uh, immune cells, which would otherwise defeat it. So that allows its um, entry into the um, host. The, that's a very good one, but you need to be specific about the life cycle. Do you remember anything about the life cycle? Uh, yeah, so, so basically the um, plasmodium will enter into blood cells themselves and therefore they go in, uh, like undetected in the blood vessels. And yeah, from mm. then on they will just replicate, burst and then go into other blood cells. Mm. So yeah, so thing is in, in, in med school, they I remember two years ago, and even now I have to relearn everything that I've learned in the past five years. We have to memorize the life cycle of malaria and the plasmodium pathogen. And the interesting thing is this pathogen sits in your liver, usually, and it's it's in a dormant state. And I think of it, it's like in a state of hypnosis, it's dormant. So we call those hypnozoites. That's the name, hypnozoites, right? And it remains dormant there, and we can't pick it up in the blood. It causes no symptoms. And so someone can have malaria, come back to Sydney, Australia, be completely fine for up to a month. And then suddenly they can break through fevers. And the interesting thing about malaria is the fevers are... The, the, the plasmodium then goes to red blood cells. Um, for the theory, uh, you kind of got cut off before. Can you repeat Which the last part? part? Yeah, okay, I, I will, I will, good. So all I was saying was that malaria can be stored in the liver in a dormant stage, and it can infect red blood cells from the liver, travel in the red blood cells, and it can burst the red blood cells, right? Mm -hmm. And the bursting of red blood cells triggers the immune system, and that can cause your systemic responses like fever. So it bursts, since it has a very cyclical lifestyle, Right, where it forms in the liver, it's dormant, and then it infects red blood cells, bursts red blood cells, and then infects more, you see a cyclical pattern of fever in patients, right? So malaria can cause a fever every four days or so. And so here it goes in red blood cells, and we have another stage called the sporozyte stage. And the only reason I'm telling you this in the context of your exams is Zachary's example was perfect, but he needs to mention buzzwords at least one, right? So he knows what he's talking about. So when you say they have a complex life cycle, you can mention that plasmodium falciparum is a falciparum is a protozoan that has a complex life cycle consisting of dormant, dormant uh, pathogen in the liver. And we can mention sporozoites that are in the red blood cells. And this enables it complex life cycle. Yeah. So it's it's multiple stages. So technically the stages here, this would actually be called gametocyte. Then it will become a sporocyte, but you don't need to know that level of detail at all. Okay, as long as you mention that mentioned one of these buzzwords. It has complex life cycle in which it tra travels between the liver and red blood cells. I think that will be enough to give you full marks. So maybe just mention liver and red blood cells. Don't worry about the buzzwords there. And this enables it to evade host defenses. Good. So those are all of yours. Now, the ones I usually think about are this one here. This is a really good one. You can mention prions, right? Prions can invade dendritic cells and thus travel via autonomic nerves from the digestive system to the brain. So that's how prion diseases can go from the food you eat. So the people who are cannibalistic and ate their deceased relatives with Kuru, that's how these prions traveled from the digestive system to the brain. 
Now you might ask, well, what the heck are autonomic nerves? Has anyone had adrenaline course through their body, maybe through a, when they when they did a you know an arcade uh, roller coaster, or you might have you know had a life threatening moment where you saw an animal or got confronted, right? If you remember, your pupils dilated, the hairs on your body rose, blood rushed to your muscles for the fight or flight response. That is all triggered by your autonomic nerves. So the way I think of it is autonomic nerves serve automatic functions in the body. So your rest and digest and your fight and flight. Okay, so that's all that is. So that's the nerves, the specific nerves that prions will invade to travel to the brain. And do you see how this is facilitating their transmission? Right, so that's one I have. Another one you can remember, the simple one is bacteria. And please do not remember all of these. You, you, you're just wasting memory space. Pick the ones that works best for you. I'm just giving you a ton. Bacteria can have enzymes like hyaluronidase. A is because it's an enzyme. Does anyone know what hyaluronidase is? It is particularly for the people that use skincare product. Does anyone know why people like to use hyaluronic acid on the skin? Anyone seen K-pop actors? They love to use it because it gets the skin nice and fair and, and plump. It glows your skin. So it's, it's a part of your connective tissue. So when you add it onto your skin, it's meant to plump it up and make it, and it technically does work, right? So hyaluronidase, it breaks down the hyaluronic acid. So it allows the bacteria to invade through your tissues. Acid, and therefore you get increased invasion. I'm not going to give you any more. This isn't a, bio, a medicine class, but you, you understand the basics here. Pick whatever is simple. I would probably not pick osmodium just because it's a little bit complex. I would probably go with this. And this one's easy. Just remember one enzyme. 